The Cube at IBM Impact 2014 is brought to you by headline sponsor IBM. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Paul Gillen. Hey, welcome back everyone. We're here live in Las Vegas for IBM Impact. This is Silicon Angles, the Cube, our flagship program, where we go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the host, with my co-host Paul Gillen, and our special guest is uh, Judith Horowitz of uh, Horowitz and Associates. Uh, welcome back to the Cube, uh, alumni again. Thanks for coming back on. Thank you. Um, this is a special uh, edition because Paul Gillen and yourself have a lot of history um, <laughs> to, to draw from. And so we will draw from that history in the computer business. Yep. Um, it's 2014 and, and it feels like we're happen? back in <laughs> like the 80s again. Back to the 80s, a time, time machine, hot tub time machine. Right. Yeah. Name frames are cool again, aren't they? <laughs> right. So, um, you know, it's, it is like the hot tub time machine. It feels like we're back in the data processing era. I mean, how many reproach reports have you done back then about getting the data, decision support, you know. Yep. I mean, how far off is it? I mean, it seems to be similar. Well, it, I think it's similar because, be, because we're dealing with the same issues and the same aspirations that we had you know, 20 or 30 years ago. People always wanted to do this stuff, but we didn't have the infrastructure, we didn't have the, um, the uh, the cost data, was very high. Data yeah. technology was not cost effective. People wanted to do this, but you would need so much computing power that, that people gave up, that you just couldn't do it. Um, so, so I think, you know, it's, it's, there's, if, if you look back in history to what people were talking about in the 50s and 1960s about what they wanted to do with, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning, and how there would be all these data rules and you and you'd have you know machines that could think and to anticipate what people wanted to do people were talking about that you know in the 50s and 60s but the technology infrastructure just wasn't there so you guys you've been documenting and Paul you've been covering you know with computer world back in the day i mean all these major inflection points and, and a lot of times you get shoveled a lot of you know vendor you know marketing and like you know here's oh we're going to do this and and a lot of the times just some, keep up, some are just trying to keep up, some are holding on with their nails, rocket ship of change, some are really ahead of the curve. How would you guys peg IBM right now in that, in that category? I mean, obviously they're, they're not going anyway. 50th anniversary of the mainframe was just here. Um, are they holding on with their nails? Do they actually have a good position? What's your take on that? So my, my take is that IBM is actually at a really important inflection point. If you look back in history to when uh, Gerstner came into IBM, IBM was at another inflection point where they had a lot of good technology, but it was not packaged and um, reflective of where the marketplace was going. And I actually think that we're back to that, um, that era with IBM right now, where IBM um, always had a lot of critical technology, but it wasn't packaged and it wasn't designed for where the market was going. So I think what you see with Ginny Rometty coming in is IBM beginning to, to refocus and, and, and to sort of get focused on really the, the key technologies that are the future. So I think IBM is doing the right thing. I think that this is a very complicated uh, transition for IBM because they are really having to get very structured and very oriented around bringing elements together that used to be their own little fiefdoms and now they're really coming together. That's a hard transition for any company. But you know, it's a good point you make uh, going back to the future. If you uh, refer to that last inflection point, if you remember in the early 90s after IBM nearly went out of business, a lot of people were talking about uh, break up the company, they had 40 different brands, and yeah, a lot of great technology, but there's no coherence to it. And then a few years ago, they come out with this, this uh, vision, smarter computing and smarter planet. And that really has, really has held together pretty well over yes, time. And yes. the whole theme of this conference about, about bringing together cloud analytics, mobility, social, uh, still plays well to that message, well, would you say? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. And I think what you saw with, with uh, 
Smarter Planet was sort of the, uh, the beginning of framing this message around data, around um, collaboration, around context, around uh, applying this technology to, to the real world of, of business and environment and, and just the way we live as human beings. So I think it set the stage and then what, and what happened when that message first came out was people said, I like this idea, what do I do first? So, so being able to go from that grand vision, which was great to say, okay, so I always like to talk about what do I do when I wake up tomorrow morning? And that's what they've been filling in. What do I do? How do I, I get these, this data to be smarter? How, how do, I bring, do I bring it together? How do I create context? How do I have the type of, of environment that scales up and scales down based on what I'm trying to do? Of course, they say the devil is in the details, of yes. course. And I, I, here you have a company, IBM, that has done, I believe, a hundred, over 130 acquisitions over the last five years. And uh, historically, not a company that's done a lot of acquisitions. They've done some very big ones. How important, or how, how good a job do you think at this point IBM is doing at digesting those acquisitions and really taking advantage of the technology and the people they acquired? I think that they've done a pretty good job. I mean, obviously, it is difficult acquiring companies, but I think because what, what IBM has really done well is they have a roadmap for the technologies that are part of this, uh, you know, Uber strategy. And what they do is they look to see where they have holes or where they have a technology is, that isn't delivering sort of the, for the future and that's where they do acquisition. So if you look, for example, at um, soft layers, I mean, they had um, cloud technology and they went to market with it and then they discovered that in order to get to the level they wanted, they needed the, the type of infrastructure and technology that SoftLayer had. So I think that that was a pretty gutsy move to, because a lot of companies that had already developed a lot of technology, went to market, were, were offering this technology, they had somebody like Danny Saba um, uh, leading this charge in the cloud from a technology perspective, it took a step back and said, okay, this works, this doesn't, this is what we need. And I think that that's the, the, a sign that IBM is really, you know, looking at acquisitions that really make a difference. I, I mean, you could talk about, you know, hundreds of them and, and where they fit and why they are, like, the, if you look at the technology, for example, that IBM has purchased in, uh, in, um, Security, phenomenal set of technology. Mm. Uh, Q Radar, a fabulous acquisition. If you look at a lot of these, um, they are really foundational technologies that make the difference between customers being happy and unhappy. Judith, I want to um, just get your take on the big picture. So here's the picture of the, the whole map solutions, Watson yeah. Foundation, yeah. big data analytics. You know, strange to what they've got going on there. And Watson certainly has got some great. Uh, sex appeal for the geeks out there, and there's a lot of innovation around that. It's the brains behind the future kind of world of data connected, all that stuff, internet things. So, so I got to get your take. Um, integration's a huge issue on these acquisitions. So like, you know, if you look at Web 1.0, Cisco did a ton of acquisitions and they were criticized for not being, you know, really building that platform. Um, is IBM good at acquisitions, and, and where are they on the integration? Are they, is it a to-do item, do you see, a big to-do item? Do they have good discipline? So I, so I think what people don't understand about acquisitions, the integration, it takes probably 20 times as long as anyone expects. It's really hard, because not only do you have some great technologies, but they have to work with the legacy that's already there. And you have to create APIs, and everything has to be modular. And, and design so that you can connect things that are, you know, have different design bases. It's really hard to do. I think, I think what, what's good about IBM is they've been very diligent about it, but I think it's taken them much longer than what they anticipated, yeah. but slowly but surely they're doing yeah. it. And, and, it. And it's different in different areas. I think they probably moved faster, for example, in security than they have in some other areas. Yeah, I mean, also too, this gets complicated when you overlay open source and this new openness framework because it's not yep. just the internal stuff that they're used to, 
they got to actually keep track of the fast moving <laughs> software yeah. world. Well, I, IBM has actually been working with open source for quite a while, going back to, to Eclipse, yeah. um, its um, uh, use of, of Unix and uh, Linux. So this is not something new to IBM, it's probably yeah. been going on, I'd say probably for the past 20 years. They've been yeah, fairly, you know, they've donated technology to the Apache Foundation. Yeah. They've moved from some of their proprietary technology to some yeah. of the, you know. And the, they have a heritage in open source, they well, right. well documented. Yeah. Um, the question is how relevant is it? Are they modern, are they up to date? Are developers in the IBM ecosystem the new hot DevOps guys that you're seeing Amazon acquire? Well, I, I think that that's what Bluemix is about. I think that's why they're doing Bluemix. I, I like the approach a lot. It's taken them a while to figure out what they need to have in terms of technology to really attract the next generation developers. I think they've got a shot at it with, with Blue Mix, but it's, it's, it's hard to really get those developers to say, you know, uh, IBM is the hot, cool platform. Yeah. I mean, they're scratching their head looking for value, we'll, but we'll see, IBM has yet to, to punch that through, so we'll see how they do. Yeah. We'll keep track of that. Uh, I got to ask you about um, what's going on with Cognitive, because you know, at all the events, we love talking about Watson, because that's like, you know, you, beat, you win at Jeopardy, that means you can do a bunch of other things. We're hearing about streaming, a lot of cool stuff going on that Watson could be a big part of, although it's one element of an overall portfolio, but what's your take on the Cognitive vision? Could you share what you've yeah. learned? Yeah, so uh, we're actually in the middle of writing a book on cognitive computing. Oh, so how ironic. spending way too much time <laughs> on that topic. Um, it's a really fascinating area, and I do think that it it's really will change everything, because it's not, you know, it's not just about a game, about Jeopardy. Jeopardy, in fact, was, was a proof of concept. It was a, it was a grand challenge, very much like you know, the, the chess game was a grand challenge. But, but, but what you got out of the grand challenge was the idea that, that you can have a learning system, that, that you can feed in massive amounts of information, have that information be used to learn um, in collaboration with subject matter experts, creating you know, ontologies and basically views of specific areas of, of whether it's um, whether it's you know a, a, a city, um, whether it's um, uh, treatment of, of a specific disease, I mean, w one of the issues if you just look at uh, oncology and the type of work that's going on with a, a number of the initiatives that IBM is collaborating with in, in healthcare, is looking at the vast amount of information out there around treatments of different cancers. So one oncologist can't possibly understand and have access to all of the new research and look at all the results and know that there's a new clinical trial that may have relevance to somebody they're treating. Or, or analyzing DNA and right. looking, for, looking for, or for patterns in DNA structures that may indicate the likelihood it, it, of cancer. It, exactly. You know, I have to say, I mean, I, I was fascinated by Watson after the Jeopardy experience and, and I thought there's so much potential here and it seemed like for a year, Watson almost went underground. There was almost no talk of it, and now IBM is sort of bringing it out again. Well, but they, there's not been a lot, it seems to me that, that IBM has not done all it could with evangelizing the potential of that well, technology. Well, and the reason I think is because, you know, if you look at what, what you have to deal with in terms of the underlying technology for this, it, you have to understand natural language processing. You have to understand the context. And it's not just, you know, regular old natural language processing, but it's looking at how words and context is related across the vast field. And then how, you know, how much can you trust um, data? So it's advanced analytics, it's big data, it's machine learning, it's natural language processing. You can go on and on. It's, you know, do you have the right ontologies and taxonomies? So the, the tech, and, and can you feed in the right data at the right time? So it's real, I mean, it's really complicated stuff. So if they had come out at that point and done a major uh, marketing of it, it would have been too early. There it's wouldn't probably, have been anything there to yeah, sell. Yeah, it's probably too early right now no. because this is something I think 10 years from now, this will be really the foundation of how we do computing. 
it's that it, it is that transformation. Do you think it is that it is that uh, far ahead of the market, or do you see as someone who's studying this area now? Do you see other technologies from other companies that are Watson-like in their uh, in their capacity? Yeah, I do see other emerging companies that are really leveraging both natural language processing and um, and machine learning. Uh, to begin to, and, and they're all very, what, what's interesting is a lot of them are very solutions focused and solutions oriented. So I think that this, because one of the problems with the way we've traditionally developed technology, it's always fit for purpose. Okay, I've got this specific problem, here are my rules, here's my data, okay, I solve for that. But you're always looking in the rear view mirror, you're always solving what the biggest problem for the market was three years ago. The difference with a cognitive learning system is that it morphs and changes because problems don't stay the same. So it's actually not programmed. And that's the real difference. So that's why I think it's so fundamental. We're going to get to something that, that you don't have to say, okay, this is my story. I'm going to write a beginning, middle, and an end, and I'm done. Well, that's why these systems today are so complicated to build because you have to anticipate everything and we can't do that. And you're really talking about predictive analytics. You're talking about the ability to forecast the future based upon what we've Pre seen in the past. Predictive analytics and advanced analytics is a core part of a cognitive hey, system. Is that the real big opportunity in analytics is predictive rather than historical? Well, you actually need both. So you need predictive and you need some of this, you know, streaming data and looking at things at real time but you also have to look at historically. So when I have a good working system, what did it look like? How did it act? So if I, I then have to compare the historical data to what's happening right now. So if it looks like it's meeting the norms and nothing else has changed, I know I'm in the right, right ballpark. If on the other hand, if what was normal before over the last six months, this looks totally different, Either I've really improved performance, so I'm doing something right, or something is def desperately wrong. Looking out at the industry landscape, we see HP clearly in a lot of trouble right now. We see Dell taking itself private. We see Oracle thrashing in the hardware market. I mean, the big players who've dominated this industry for many years, pretty much all having trouble. IBM seems to be an exception. Is, is this industry devolving into much smaller specialty players, or is there a role for the big companies like IBM? In the, I think forward? there is definitely a role for the big companies, but they have to, you know, the big companies have to take more risks. I think one reason the Dell went private is so it could take more risk. Would a public market have allowed Dell to, to uh, move away from commodity PCs. I don't think so, no. be, because- you It know, would become you, compact. Yeah, um, you know, you've, you've got so, you know, you've got revenue but not profit. And people get scared of giving up um, revenue even though it, it really is draining the company. So, so What about you know, best of breed? I mean, that's always been kind of like, in those kind of like trough between inflection points. People get best of breed, okay, I'm the best of breed server, I'm best of breed this. Now, if, the if you believe the cognitive thing will be transformative, which I believe, I agree, that levels the field in terms of now, it's, it, or does it? I mean, that's my, I guess my question is that. Does the, cognitive level? You know, if, if things like cognitive continue to, continue to uh, arrive on the scene, it's going to disrupt the status quo. Yes. So d will the best of breed mindset continue to be, so Dell's taking more chances, you know, I can see them saying, hey, we must build a mobile app, maybe, I don't know, maybe mobile phone, who knows? But obviously Michael's got some plans. So how do people like IBM, HP, do they maintain that we're best of breed? Or does it go away more? Well, I actually, I actually don't think, you know, the, the large companies do necessarily best of breed. They do uh, best of solution. So, so they, you know, they invest in, uh, in, in best of breed in order to create things that link elements together. So this, this idea around you know, creating composites you know, is, is really the future. Um, and, and I think that's what we started with, the service-oriented you, you like, you like the You like the composite apps vision. I, I do, that's, what, that's where we started with uh, service-oriented architectures. You had business services, you link them together uh, to create value. That's, that's what we've been, you know, none of these new technologies 
happen in a year and then go away. All right, so I got to ask you the question, yeah. you might have hit it, but what's around the corner? What are people missing uh, around in the landscape? Obviously we know with big data, cloud, social, all that stuff's happening, but what, from your perspective, seeing, drawing on some of the historical views we were just talking about, 80s, 90s, 2000s, what's, what do you, what's, What's your perspective? What's the blind spot for the vendors, the industry? What's around the corner from your perspective? Well, you know, I, I think I think a lot of it is still. A, I, I think we have only we are only so, sort of at the one percent mark with things like cognitive, big data, um, you know, predictive and prescriptive analytics. Is how do you really use data? You know, if 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 for example you have you know the whole area of probes and been able to collect data in real time and then use that in an anticipatory way to figure out what's going to happen next. You know, I don't think that right now we're looking at things that are totally different, but I think that we're about to get into an absorption phase. We've got, you know, how do you do prescriptive things that tell you not just, okay, this is what's going to happen, but if that's happening, what do I actually do about it? That's where a prescriptive comes in. What do I do about all that dark data? I've collect, you know, log data that I've been collecting for 30 years. What do I do with that? It's dark side of the moon kind of stuff. It's a little bit of a Pink Floyd kind of yeah. metaphor. How do I really create um, cognitive uh, systems? And how, you know, how much is it uh, human intervention yeah. versus how much is it, you know, do do I let a machine just tell me what what drug to prescribe? Or, think, or is it a collaboration? I think there's going to be some new stuff that's going to pop out of the woodwork that's going to catch people off guard. We'll but but I think that. It'll, it, that new stuff will come out of what we learn from all this. Yeah, it's hard to predict. So yeah. even have best predictive analytics, you can't predict the next that's right. black swan. This is theCUBE. We're trying our best to, to do predict the future. We'll be right back here at IBM Impact right after this short break.